Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you to our worship service at First Baptist Church of College Hill. May God bless you. May God enrich you as we worship him in the beauty of holiness. Oh, how precious, how precious. 
Oh, how precious, precious is His name. When you're lonely, your heart filled with despair, remember God cares. God cares for you. Oh, how precious, oh, how precious, precious is his name. Oh, how precious, oh, how precious, oh, how precious, precious is his name.
we come to this prayer moment in our service, I just want to highlight several that we want to keep lifted up in prayer today. First of all, the family of our dear sister Elvira Pinder, whose funeral service was yesterday, and we said uh, see you later to her because we do one day anticipate that we will reunite with Sister Elvira Pinder. And so to the family, we want to um, offer our prayers and our comfort to them. Also, Reverend uh, Daryl Collins lost his sister. Her funeral was yesterday as well. And so we want to lift him up, his family, that God would sustain them in this time of bereavement. We also want to remember Sister Ebony Wilson uh, and uh, Minister Marcus Wilson on the passing of her uncle. And so again, lift them up before the Lord in prayer. We want to remember the mother of Dr. Daryl Matthews, who is in hospital at this time, and he is in California uh, uh, spending some time with her. And so we pray again for that family and for his mom during this season of, of trial. We want to also lift up uh, Deacon Walter Phillips, to, uh, pray for him, uh, for God's healing in his life as well. And others who, whose names do not come at this time, but others who you may call, just call their name as we go before the Lord in prayer. And so let's bow our heads before him today. Father God, we thank you in the precious name of Jesus, your son. You said that we come and we call on you and we come through the name of the Lord Jesus. And so we come in faith for these whose names we've called. For the family of Deaconess Pinder, the family of Reverend Daryl Collins, the family of Daryl Matthews, uh, Deacon Walter Phillips, Minister Marcus and Ebony Wilson. God, we also want to lift up Sister Evelyn Atkinson. We want to pray, Father, for the Reese family. For others, Lord, who are either sick in nursing homes or they're bedridden. Father, we pray that you would so overshadow them with your presence that they would know that saints all over this city are praying for them even now. And then, God, we lift up our church family as a whole. Lord, we've been separated physically all these months. But, God, I thank you for those who continue to stay in touch, continue to lift each other up in prayer, continue to share in fellowship, whether it's by telephone, whether it's by teleconferencing. God, as we continue to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Father, more than that, we thank you that we have tried to stay on mission. We've started, tried to remember that, that, that the, the, the building may be closed, but the church is still open. Lord, now more than ever, we realize that our Christianity is not confined to the four walls of a building, but it is extended to wherever your saints may be. So God, we pray that even now someone may say yes to the claims of Christ because you said to us, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. And that, Lord, is our mission. But God, we don't want to forget all that is going on in this season. We don't want to forget this pandemic that has gripped the world. But God, as we Look back over history. We realize that, th that this is not the first, and should you tarry, this will most likely not be the last. But God, we know that in the midst of this, there is damage. In the midst of this, there is loss of life. In the midst of this, there are those, Father, who may be losing hope. But we are your children. And we know that you promise not to allow fear to capture us, Lord, but that love and a sound mind would reign. And so, God, we come not unaware of what's going on around us, but we are aware of who is in control. And so, God, today we pray that you would see us through to the other side. God, for the continued uh, civil unrest in our nation. And for God, for some of us, we're outside of it. We, we're not in the midst of it, while others are right in the epicenter. But God, the effects and the ripple effects of what goes on, we're praying, God, that, that good would come out of whatever is going on. 
God, that you would see us in a better place than when we started, that you would see our world in a better place than when this began, that God, it would be an impetus for change, an impetus, God, for us to do better. And so, Father, I pray right now that in the midst of all of it, that, that, that Jesus would come out victorious. And so, God, right now, I pray that as we continue to worship you, that you would minister to us deep into our being. And for this, Lord, we ask that you would just minister in a special way today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a few announcements that I want to share with our church family. We are about to begin a new life group series. And that is entitled The Miracle of Mercy. The Miracle of Mercy. The series will begin the first week in September, but study guides will go on sale this month, the 20th of July. And so that will run through the month of August. And uh, there are various ways in which you can uh, receive a book. We will be uh, putting uh, information online. And you can go online, you can purchase your book, and then we will have uh, several ways in which you can receive it. You can either receive it through the mail. You can receive it by coming to the church and we're having what we're calling curbside pickup. Or you can go through your life group host, your life group leader uh, for your book. The cost of the books are $10 a piece. And we are looking forward to another great time of study as a church as we look at the miracle of mercy. And so, uh, again... Uh, books will go on sale the 20th of this month, and so just look forward to your um, email accounts, your uh, text messages should be going out to alert you when we're ready to begin receiving orders. Also, I want to remind you that the deadline for registration in order to vote in the upcoming primary is also July 20th. And so if you've not yet registered, I want to encourage you to go ahead and do that, and also to uh, vote early. It's so much easier when you do it because you can vote anywhere in the county if you're doing it early, whereas on voting day, you have to go to your specific uh, precinct. And so it is so much easier if you do it ahead of time, wherever you are, you can just stop in where you don't see a line, just get in there, do your thing, and you're done. So we encourage you to do that uh, as well. And finally, for those who are new to our stream and have not yet uh, been familiarized with how we are giving during this time of absence from the church facility. There are four ways in which you can do that. And the first is to go to our website. On the website, at the top, there is a link that says online giving. You click on that link and it will give you instructions on how you can uh, give towards the work of the Lord. The second is in an app called Give Plus. And if you go to your App Store or your Google Play Store, you can find the app there called Give Plus. And when you uh, download that app, search for our church by name or by zip code, and instructions will follow on how you can sign up for that. Also, text to give is available, and that's simply by texting, and, and there will be a number uh, on the screen that, will, that you can uh, type in that number and send a text to that, and again, information will come. And finally... Uh, what we call the traditional snail mail. And so you can continue to send your mail uh, to the church, 3838 North 29th Street, Tampa, Florida, 33610. And so those are the announcements for, for this week. And I just want to give a shout out to this uh, music ministry. These have not been uh, normal times. We've had requests from time to time, and why don't you all do this, or why don't you do that? But we've been trying our best to limit the number of people that are uh, involved in, in the um, services um, up to this point. But I also want to thank those who've been willing to come, been willing to brave um, this, this season and come out and, and minister. I want to thank uh, our minister of music, Wendell Robinson, for his tenacity and for his faithfulness and commitment to the work of the Lord. I also want to give a shout out to our uh, engineers, our sound and video people who have also been coming consistently to make sure that we are, are, are live and that we can stream the services to you. 
So this morning, I want to bring our musicians back, our praise team. They're going to come and minister in song. And when they're done, I'll be back with a word from the Lord for this morning. We thank you, Lord, so much for all that you're doing in spite of everything that's going on. You still make a way, God. And we appreciate that. We thank you for your unselfish love. We thank you, Lord God. Thank you. You are here. Lord, we worship you. 
Father God, we thank you today for this opportunity to once again stand in this pulpit to teach your word that saints would be edified and that sinners would be converted. And so it is my prayer that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Good morning again, everybody. We are in the book of Joshua this morning. Joshua, the seventh chapter, is going to be the bulk of our focus this morning. And we're going to be looking at a really interesting uh, set of circumstances. When I was in school, I would not say I was the uh, best behaved kid in the class, but nor would I say I was the worst. I, I certainly was not that. I, I, I was pretty much a, a um, I was a good kid, if I would say so myself, but even good children got in trouble. But there was one thing that I, that I hated about school more than the work more than having to go. But it was when a teacher would punish the whole class for the offense of one student. And it seemed as if there were some teachers that just loved that particular punishment. If they couldn't get a certain student under control, I think what they were trying to do was to get the rest of us to, uh, by peer pressure, force the other kid to behave. But they would say, if you don't behave, this whole class is going to stay behind for lunch, during lunch. And the kid who got in trouble was happy for the company. While everybody else was mad and thought it was unfair. In Joshua chapter 7, we find the story of a victorious community. A community that enjoyed the blessing of God. But it was not long, however, before this community found itself defeated because one member of that community chose to disobey. One of the harshest lessons of life is that actions have consequences. My grandmother had a saying that I hate it, but I can't dismiss it nor deny its truthfulness. You see, we children would be having a ball playing in the house. We'd be running and jumping and wrestling and I mean, just having a grand old time doing whatever we did in the house. And, and my grandmother, what we call her mama, a mama would say, children, after laugh, come cry. And right on cue, someone's head would hit the wall. <laughs> somebody would poke somebody in the eye. Somebody would head butts. Something would go awry and crying would start. And my, mom, my grandmother was right. After laugh, too often came, cry. In other words, she, she had lived long enough to know that what we were doing was going to get somebody hurt. And there was always a consequence to running in the house. For the nation of Israel, there was no avoiding the consequences of their actions. The community of Israel, before they had fully conquered and settled down in the promised land, that generation of Hebrews had experienced the first Passover in the land of Egypt and they had seen the mighty hand of God part the Red Sea. But that generation had died by this time. That generation failed to trust the Lord. 
the one who promised to give them victory. And so he made them live like nomads for 40 years in the wilderness. It's kind of like when you don't listen to your parents, then you suffer the consequences. Someone has said, if you can't hear, you'll feel. I don't know how many of y'all ever had somebody say that to you before, but it tell me, if you can't hear, you'll feel. You know, that, that, that was just the way I grew up. You know, uh, after laugh, come cry. If you can't hear, you'll feel. All, all those sayings that, that really were saying there is a consequence to behavior. There is consequence to action. And so that was the old generation. They, 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 they didn't listen to God and they end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Now we come to this new and younger generation and they needed encouragement. So the Lord gave them a miraculous victory against the fortress city we know as Jericho. On our trip to Israel back in 2019, we had the privilege of visiting Jericho. And the amazing thing about Jericho is that there's really not a whole lot left there. And what I remember most about Jericho was this camel that was full of flies. That's all I remember about Jericho. Jericho, I remember the, the, the camel of flies that this guy wanted us to get on and ride. And I was like, nah, ain't getting on that. But, but, but Jericho in, in the scripture that, we, that we'll read was, was, was where God gave the children of Israel this awesome victory. And I, and I just want to read chapter 6, verse 15 through 21. It'll bring us up to speed on the story. And it begins, on the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. And these devoted things were those things that were devoted uh, uh, to, to the pagans. And he says, don't touch those things that were devoted, that were separated, that were used in the service so that you will not bring, ab down, bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. God is clear. He goes on, all the silver and, all, and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted and all, so, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone charged straight in and they took the city. And then they devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. And, and, and at another time, we can really try to dissect that, but, but God said, I want everything destroyed. There's a song attributed to African slaves here in America called Joshua Fit the Battle of Jericho. And we know we've sung that song so many a time, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. You could talk about the men of Gideon. You could talk about the men of Saul, but they're none like good old Joshua at the battle of Jericho. As often is the case, victory can turn to defeat. I want to give you a story. Some years ago, the Indianapolis Colts came to Tampa. And Tampa was whooping up on the Indianapolis Colts. I mean, they were, I mean, they, they were beating them fourth quarter. Almost, I think it was like 21 to 3, I believe the score was, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm correct. Tampa Bay Buccaneer fans started leaving the stadium because they knew what was about to happen. 
The Bucks were going to win. It was over. They wanted to beat the traffic and get home. Little did they know <laughs> that Peyton Manning was about to put on the show of his life. And by the end of the buzzer in the fourth quarter, the Bucks lost the game. That will go down in history. No one, that, that never should have happened. We, we had the game. But you know, sometimes you can snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory. And as so often is the case, victory can turn to defeat. And this is what happened to the Israelites. God had given them this great victory at Jericho. And then we come to chapter 6, verse 27, and we read these words. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land, but the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted thing. Achan, son of Hamari, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. Took some of what? Some of the devoted things that they were told not to touch. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. God, God, this is where my teachers must have gotten this from because here it was. It says Achan took the devoted things. It says, but God anger burned against Israel. I, I can see my teacher now. Uh, if you don't sit down, boy, this whole class is going to stay. But teacher, I didn't do anything. Uh, no, 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 no. The innocent's going to suffer for the guilty. And that's what happens here. Uh, Achan sinned by taking what God had forbidden. And in doing so, God's anger burned not only against Achan, but begins, sorry, against the community. Because Achan was a part of the community. Do you know as a pastor, sometimes I think that churches get in trouble and churches stagnate and churches don't move because there's sin in the camp? You know, we think that sometimes we can avoid what's going on because I didn't do it or someone else is living outside of God's will. And we wonder why the community doesn't progress and sometimes it's because we tolerate in the community sin. So that's where Israel found itself. And so if, if we jump with me to, to Joshua chapter 7, verse 2 and verse 3, here's what we read. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. Now, now what, what's happening now is that the battle of Jericho is over. They won the victory. Achan takes uh, uh, the devoted things. And God is angry at Israel. But you know, if you win, you get confidence. If you win decisively, you get cocky. Oh, I can handle this. We, it's all good. So now they say, you know what? Go out and spy out AI. We took Jericho. We're about to take AI. We're we, we, we going to get it. So now Joshua sent men from Jericho to AI, which is near Beth, Aven, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out AI. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the army will, go, will have to go up against AI. Send two or 3,000 men to take it and do not weary the whole army for only a few people live there. Overconfidence is a terrible thing. They did not take into consideration God's anger that was burning against them for the sin that, a that, that, that Achan had committed. See, the report they brought back was based on previous victory. It was based on what had transpired before. It, based, it was based on, uh, on their good fortune at Jericho. And so they didn't take the army of AI seriously. As a result, they experienced a serious stinging defeat. I remember I played uh, Pony League baseball. I was recruited by a friend in my class, and I had never played baseball before. And he recruited his classmates, and we joined this team. And the great thing about it is that this team had a sponsor. And so there was this company, that, that this man who had come into the neighborhood, and he wanted to sponsor a team. And so, man, he bought us these nice cream colored uniforms and they were trimmed in, 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 in red, red, white, and blue trim on it. And I mean, this, this was nice stuff. We had the nice holes that came up around. I mean, we, we were saying something. 
And so this one Saturday, we had a game with a team from an area of the city that we would call today the hood. And so we show up on this field and we're out there and we're, I mean, we're, 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 you know, we're playing, we're warming up. And man, we look good. And we look up and here comes the, our, our opponents. And these guys are coming with mismatched tennis shoes, cut off jeans, gloves that look like it been slept on. I mean, they, you know, these guys, they just came out there. They're like, yeah, yeah, we about to play. And we were like, yeah, man. We, I mean, we were feeling good. We got this. Until the game started. There was a guy on the mound. His name was Eyes. That's his nickname, was Eyes. And Eyes, <laughs> let's just say, I don't even know how many strikeouts Eyes had that day. It was like target practice. I mean, Eyes was just mowing us down, left, right, and center. They whooped us so bad, they almost had to invoke the mercy rule. What we found out after the game was over was that we misjudged the team because of how they looked. What we later found out was that Eyes had an older brother who was the first Bahamian pitcher to make it to the major leagues. He pitched for the Atlanta Braves. So I, I, I had about five other brothers and all of them were like top-notch baseball players in the country. And I was pretty much on his way to being like his brother's. And so we misjudged. We misjudged our opponents. We didn't see them for who they were. And this is what happened to the Israelites. They misjudged. Because of they, they had won the game before and they figured because we won so decisive, we can win this one too. And they went in unprepared and they had a stunning defeat. And so it says about 3,000 went up, but they were routed by the men of AI. I, I like that word, routed. It was a clean sweep. I mean, they didn't, they didn't get no, no, no hits. No fouls, no errors. I mean, it was a no-hitter. They killed about 36 of them. And listen to this. They chased the Israelites from the city gates as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Joshua now goes back to God and he starts to cry out to God. And he says... God, the elders of Israel went out and, 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 and look, we've been slaughtered. And so the Bible says Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there until the evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan? Man, he's, still, he's, starting to, he's starting to lick his wounds and cry. Lord, why did you even bring us over here? You should have just left us in Egypt where we could have had them leeks and garlics. Why you brought us out so we could suffer this kind of defeat at the hands of the Amorites for them to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say? Now that Israel has been routed by its enemies, the Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about all this. And they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. And I want you to listen to this last phrase by Joshua. What then will you do for your own great name? Talk about blame. Talk about shift responsibility. All this go down. They do what they do. They go in. They misjudge. They do, and then he says to God, so what you going to do about it? <laughs> your, your name is on the line. Your name is at stake. Reminds me about this guy, a friend of mine told me about he, uh, on his job, and he had this guy come in, and he and his girlfriend or wife got into this, th th this argument. And, um, and she made some comment like, well, I I'll, I'll, just stop, I'll just stop ironing your shirt so you look all wrinkled up when you go to work. <laughs> and he goes, I don't care, because I'll just tell him you nasty. <laughs> Now, I know them fighting words, but, but, but you know, sometimes, we, sometimes it's just so hard for us to, 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 to take the responsibility. We're going to throw somebody else 
under the bus. It's interesting how Joshua throws it back at God. And so here's the scenario. Israel had lost its way because of sin in the camp. And so I want to give three applications and then we'll be done today. Number one, when there's sin in the camp, it must be confronted. 7 through 15, Joshua 7, 10 through 15. Sin must be confronted. Because the Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What you're doing on your face? He says, Israel has sinned. They violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. Then God goes on to say to him, he says, listen, you need to destroy everything. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. Why? Because they're weakened. They're weakened because of their sin. How often in our life we don't see the blessings of God. We don't see God's power exhibited in our life. We don't see God working through us. And and, and we don't stop long enough to think that the reason could be that there's sin in our life. We're not doing what God. Listen to what he says. He says they have stolen They have lied. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. God says to them, I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Go, he says, consecrate the people. Tell them to consecrate themselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. Can I take a moment and just say this? Maybe there's something in your life right now that needs to be removed. I don't know what that thing is, but you know what it is. There's something that in the doing of that thing, there is a a rebellion against God. In the doing of their thing, there is a distance between you and the Lord in, in, in the holding on to that thing. And I will say to you, I know that there have been things in my life and I know there are things in your life. That we held on to, and you know, sometimes it's not even the worst, sometimes it's just the, the, the good being the enemy of the best. But maybe it is sin. Maybe it is that untold thing, that thing that you need to confess to the Lord and repent of and get it out of your life so that your life can move on. So God gets them together and they come, and eventually they whittle it down until they expose. Achan. Because here's what the Lord says. Whoever is caught with a devoted thing will be destroyed by fire along with all that belongs to him. Again, we've seen twice now God is being seriously harsh about sin. We tolerate sin. We don't see sin the way God sees sin. God sees sin in a far more uh, uh, dramatic way than we see sin. But I want us to recognize that Disobedience has consequences. They lost the battle they should have won because of disobedience. And Joshua reacted in grief for all the fallen men, grief for the nation's future, and ultimately for the integrity of God's name. When he saw what happened, he says, God, this is, this is, this is incredible. And the Bible says he literally weeped. He fell on his face and he covered his head in ashes. Because he was in such distress. How often have we really been in distress over our sin? You know, we may acknowledge it, yeah, that was wrong, but we just kind of keep moseying on. But when was the last time you mourned over your sin? When was the last time you weeped over your sin? When was the last time you were hurt over your sin? One thing that we notice here is that the trouble remained until the sin was removed. Achan was exposed. Achan was confronted. Paul says in in Corinthians that a man examine himself. You know, sometimes we can be exposed by others, but we don't want to be exposed of ourselves. We've lived through an incredible time doing what we call the, what's been called the, the Me Too movement. And the incredible thing about the Me Too movement is that as people begin to become exposed, some were defiant while some were crushed. But as Chuck Swindoll says, that no one falls in a moment. 
They may be exposed in a moment, but no one falls in a moment because usually the exposure is an exposure of a pattern of behavior that leads ultimately to the fall. That's why I believe when Paul says, let a man examine himself, Paul is saying you need to get your house in order because the day will come, number two, when private sin takes on a public face. You see, what's done in the dark will come to the light. Because early the next morning, it says, in verse 16 to 22, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes, and Joshua was chosen. Sorry, Judah was chosen. Clans of Judah came forward. The Zezerites came forward. He had the clan of Zeherites come forward by families. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame, sorry, and Zimri was chosen. Joshua and his family came forward by man by man and Achan, son of Hamari. And they all began to come forward until what happened? Until he was exposed. You see, other people are affected by our private sin. Think about it for a moment. Think about people who, who, who were connected. To, and we all know whether it's in politics, whether it's in entertainment, whether it's in the church. It's not only the person who is exposed who, who, who faces uh, uh, ridicule or exposure, but it's the people around them that have to deal with the fallout. Other people are affected by our private sin. You see, sin doesn't depend on whether someone else is hurt. You can also sin against God. For every sin we sin is a sin against God, but it's also a sin against other people. But ultimately, sin does not depend on whether someone else is hurt but it depends on whether God is offended. That sin in private makes its way to the public. And I came up with a list of names, and I, I, I'm not even going to read them, because most of these people have already suffered public shame. Their families have gone through it inside and outside of the church. You see, that first hit of cocaine was in private, but now everybody knows. That first date with someone else's wife was in secret, but now it's on Front Street. That first stealing out of the till at work, but now it's on the nightly news. I just saw a report just recently of a church bookkeeper in Polk County that stole over a quarter million dollars over several years. See, what's done in the dark will eventually come to the light. Third and finally, confrontation must be quick and decisive and thorough. Verse 23 to 25, they took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. And Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons, his daughters, his cattle, his donkey, sheep, his tents, and all that he had to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned them, and after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. Wow. What an incredibly harsh punishment. And I share this because, see, God takes sin seriously. And I think so often churches confuse grace with accountability. Because very often... Uh, when, 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 we, when we commit wrongs, there is accountability. That's why there's a justice system. But even if you confess and repent, sometimes there's still jail time to be done. Paul says in, five, in 1 Corinthians 5, 13, he talks, he says, put out the wicked one. Put out the wicked one. Too many churches are unwilling to expose sin. They're unwilling to call sin out. And I, I, we, we live in a generation now where, 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 where we've moved the pendulum the opposite direction from when I was uh, growing up. And, and, and I think it's not all bad. Because there was a time when, 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 when you know, we, we loved exposing folk in church. And we've moved away from that quite a bit, but I think we ought not to move so far away that we no longer call sin, sin, and call out sin when sin happens. For we even see that Jesus took care 
of the temple violators. What did Achan do? Achan disobeyed God. And God said to him, don't take the devoted thing. But Achan took them. And because of his disobedience, God brought defeat upon the children of Israel. Many times in our own life, we're living defeated Christian lives. We're wandering around in the wilderness, unable to find Canaan land because there's sin in our life. I want you today to think about your own life right now. Is there something in your life that needs confessing? Is there something that you're living that's not in accordance with truth? Are there things that you've carried over from your old life that are still weighing you down? Is there a new habit, a new sin that you picked up and, and it's dragging behind you like, a, like an anchor and you need to cut it loose? I want to call on you to repent today. Go before the Father and say, God, I confess my sin. I confess that I've taken the devoted thing. I confess. Forgive me and cleanse me. For sin in the camp ultimately stinks. You see, I can imagine right now if you are carrying around unconfessed sin, there's a part of you that's uneasy. There's a part of you that's not quite secure. Go before the Father and confess it. Because when wrong is uncovered, and, that, and that's not even when it's uncovered publicly, when it's uncovered in your own life, when the Holy Spirit reveals it to you, you need to deal with it swiftly, decisively, and thoroughly. And so I want to say a prayer this morning, two prayers. The first for Christians who need to confess. And then the second for those who may want to become followers of Jesus. And so would you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day, for this challenge from your word, for Achan who in disobedience took the devoted things. Father, there may be Christians listening right now who have unconfessed sin in their life that need to be dealt with. Father, as they confess, I know that you will keep your word and you will cleanse them. And Lord, there may be someone that's right now saying yes for the first time. They're saying, Lord Jesus, save me from my sins. I trust you with my whole heart. Make me your child. And the Bible says that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, that we would be saved. And that can be your confession today. Lord, I love you. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins and I trust you as my way to heaven. And he says if you do that, that you would become his child. Father, I thank you so much for your word. But I thank you for Jesus who died on the cross was buried in a borrowed tomb but came back to life thank you for your so great salvation walk with us this week as we go about life's journey we pray this in jesus name amen amen god bless you if you prayed that sinner's prayer today and you'd like to reach out to us you can send us an email at pray for me at fbcch.org that's pray the number four me at fbcch.org. God bless you. Have a great week.
great and mighty. Great and mighty. Oh, great, great and mighty. For he is holy. For he is holy. He's holy. He's the lily of the valley. Bright and morning star. His name. He's holy, great and mighty, great and mighty, great and mighty, great and mighty, great and mighty. Come on, help me sing, I don't hear you. Great and mighty, great and mighty, great and mighty, great. Hallelujah!